And today we have 500 formal members. We have, uh, as of this morning, I checked, we have 5,950 subscribers to the newsletter. And that number is up from only about 2,000 about a year ago. So it is nearly tripled in the last year. And it is going, uh, it is going up still. We have 30 affiliate networks. Uh, with probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of members between them. Our website gets 800 to 1,000 unique visits per day on a typical day. It can be as high as 4 or 5,000 on a larger day. And some of our articles have a reach of up to 45,000 people per article so far. We are expanding now, experimenting with having yearly conferences. We had one last year in Seoul, we have a next year in Lisbon, and one a year after that in Helsinki. And our vision... What? Oh, oh, really? Okay. Well, somewhere in Finland. They've got, they've got lots of cities there. It's in one of them. Uh, uh, our, vision, our vision over the last 30 years has been to serve the needs of the basic income community. First with conferences and a regular newsletter to give people a forum. And that's basically what we've done as an organization. Uh, now, as individuals who are part of that organization, we've done much more. But basically, our vision is to try these basics. We've expanding that a bit with not only a, news, a newsletter, uh, but a news website, which goes out every day with congresses. And now we're in the position we've created a formal structure, 30 years old, and the first time we have a formally, re nationally, legally chartered organization. Uh, organizational foundation which will allow us to do greater fundraising and we're really trying to get these basics down right now and it's time building on these basics to talk about expanding the vision of BN. What can BN do in the future to be a better service to all of its member networks around the world which are now on all the continents, all the inhabited continents, and what can we do for all the other, all the other basic income supporters around the world? How can we expand this vision and be better service to them? And in that spirit, I welcome you here to the 30th anniversary conference. Thank you very much. So to give you an idea of the contrast between uh, what we just heard and then the first decades of, uh, uh, of the Basic Income Network, you can pick up, uh, if uh, there are some left, a number of whatever is left of the copies, the printed copies of the newsletters that were sent for about uh, one and a half decade, uh, three times per year uh, at most, uh, by post. There, each of them was uh, uh, written just across the road, then uh, it was printed in a print shop uh, nearby. Then it was uh, put in an envelope one by one. And then uh, a stamp was put on it, uh, stuck on it. And then we carried the pile on the letterbox, which you can still see on the, uh, on the, place, uh, on the place Montesquieu. And then that was costly. And so we had to collect uh, fees, yearly fees. We didn't have life members, uh, as, and we'll have one more in, uh, in, uh, by the end of this weekend, uh, Axel. So we introduced that later, sort of a life membership. At that time, we needed, because it, it was costly to send these things, we, uh, Alexander was a treasurer for a long time. All different and currencies. And the various currencies, so people, and because of the bank charges, in fact, people send these things in Deutsche Mark, in Pesetas, and all the rest, in an envelope. And uh, I got it in an envelope, I had to go and change it in the bank, and then put it into uh, Vian's uh, bank account. Just think about the luxury you enjoy now, and how widespread uh, the network can be, thanks to this change uh, in uh, technology, because uh, I'm the uh, uh, and the things that have just been described, including the very existence of a worldwide network, uh, would just have been impossible. And so it took us quite a while to be convinced by the very convincing Eduardo Suplicy to turn our network into a basic income earth network, which happened only in uh, 2004, because Proceeding if in addition to Zetas you had yens and all the things in an envelope coming away, it wouldn't have been possible to run it. So that, that's uh, what happened. So a long way has, uh, uh, has been uh, treaded since then. 
So what I would like to do now is uh, invite uh, a number of uh, founders uh, to come forward and uh, sit here. I think uh, Paul Marie uh, will be starting, so he's, uh, uh, he's on this picture. So if you can come here, and then Klaus, uh, uh, Annie, who, who, Annie Miller, who you could see on the on, the, on that, you can see someone sharing the meeting there. Here she is. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Klaus Guy. Uh, yeah, Guy is there. And uh, Robert van der Veen. Okay. So do sit down. Yeah. So that that was uh, younger at the time, but that still looks quite young, right? <laughs> I start. Yeah, you start. Okay. So 30 years ago, here, right here in where I go, not in this building, I think it was in the building in front of this one, were several small streams that were flowing more or less unknown to each other in different European <coughs> countries went to converge and form a river which has since grown and grown to us to have today's shores in the five mountains of the earth. One of those little streams had its source in here in Nouvelle and I had the shame, the shame to be associated with its birth and development and to see it eventually join all the other ones and pour itself in the Bihar River. So what I will try to do now is just evoke the main stage of the short, no more than 30 months, more or less, but tremendously exciting and stimulating history of the small Belgian stream known as the Collective Chalfoyer. Okay, it's it start. It started in, in March 1984 uh, when Philippe wrote a scenario, Clever Cassandra and submitted uh, under the collective software signature to the contest Agora Travail, launched by the King Bodena Foundation here in Belgium. This was the first appearance both of the collective software as signature and also the allocation, allocation universal labor that has never been uh, published before. And the idea germinated in Philippe's mind uh, when he was in England, I think. And then it had been nurtured in the socio-economic commission of the very young Green Party, Ecolo, of which uh, Philippe, Philippe de Faith and I were members. And which therefore acts more or less as a kind of incubation room uh, for, for the idea. The second significant moment is in April uh, 1984, the, the institutionalization of the group uh, collective Charfourier that was dev devoted to the exploration uh, of, of the idea. And uh, the group was mainly composed of young researchers and academics, but not only. There was also, also uh, people working in uh, association, generally close to the Christian Democrats, trade union, and party, uh, or also in, in public, uh, in public uh, organization. Uh, not all of them were willing to endorse the idea in a political sense uh, as something to be put really on the political agenda. But all of them liked as fascinating thought experiments, even if they were not ready to advocate it in public arenas. So the ending view of the group was to explore it as a kind of scientific hypothesis and practically to publish a special issue of the journal, the generous journal, the Revue Nouvelle, which is a generous sort of relatively high level, uh, intellectual level, and which was also close to, to the left of the, of the Christian Democrat uh, period. In November, I'm not sure if it is November or in November or October, that uh, the scenario of the collective for was awarded uh, in the uh, contest. But anyway, 
it was, and uh, there had been almost more than 200 uh, submit, proposals submitted, I think, to the, to the contest, yes. I think 227, something like that. So five of them had been uh, selected, and one was for the Christian Medicine. And, and uh, there was a prize money, and what would be very useful, it was 3,250 euros nominally, but it was much more at that time in purchasing power, and uh, it was very welcome because it enabled us to consider organizing a first international conference on basic income. The decision to organize the conference has been taken exactly in the 24 January of uh, 1985, and here you see an excerpt of a letter written by Philippe, who was then in Amsterdam, uh, and he was the people called the main organizer of the collective. And uh, you remind us we had taken responsibility uh, for organizing, and it was mainly his responsibility, I think, to, to organize it, but we were all committed, of course, to it. And then the, the most, probably most significant event uh, in the just, just after maybe the organization of the, the first conference, and it was the, the publication of the special issue of the Revue Nouvelle uh, on the idea of uh, Gaston Versailles, an idea for Vivre Autrement, an idea to, to another, toward another way of living, so, another, another way of life, and we had uh, already a lot of uh, contribution coming, of course, from Belgium, but also from our country. Robert Van der Veen had made a contribution, uh, uh, I think, uh, close off, or see, I'm not sure. Uh, but of course, there was also Michael uh, Kierka from Germany, uh, we had people from France, uh, you know, Bresson, I think. You had uh, from, you have uh, also Audrey um, Goss, of course, which was very, we were very honored to have uh, also Audrey Goss. And it was, it was uh, really, it's kind of rehearsed or all preparation for the for the, the congress or the conference because it was it was dedicated to the way the, the idea was being discussed not only in Belgium but already in other countries. Of course, the reception in the Belgian media was not very warm. Yeah. You have some excerpt of what was prepared in the newspaper in French. I don't, I don't, you have some allocation, yeah, basic um, no thanks, mm, or uh, yeah, basic income, a trap, or a really alternative, or uh, a social major regression, uh, also uh, playing, just playing into the hands of cynical neoliberalism. <laughs> uh, and indeed, we cannot say that the idea has been looked at with sympathy, especially by the circle of which we naively thought we were closest. Uh, even the Green Party, so it officially put it as a program, was reluctant to talk about it, let alone to really advocate it. We were considered at best as harmless utopians, at worst, and most often than not, as irresponsible freaks, ready to jeopardize the social heritage of the workers' struggles. I remember very well personally having been called crazy by a leader of the Socialist Trade Union in Bologna. So, <laughs> but it was funny anyway. Uh, here I show an example of an invitation uh, sent in December 8, 1985 for the conference. It's interesting because. <coughs> okay. That, that okay. means that you are at the five minutes and you have two more minutes to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's interesting because something I did remember it is written that uh, the funding of the conference is very scarce, partly due to the fact that we didn't want to stretch the scope of the meeting to the future of the welfare state or the like. This means that uh, we could have some subsidies to organize it, provided we not the scope to the welfare state that it was not possible to have subsidy. It was if it was devoted only to the basic income. I think that's significant of the of the atmosphere in which uh, we had to, to, to work at that time. And then uh, of course here we have the the big announcement of the birth of the of the BIA in the first conference, the founding meeting of the Basic Commute Network took place at Gouverneur in Belgium on September 6, 
It was attended by more than 70 people from 14 different countries. They have attended the first Jack conference in Mexico, organized by the Collective Chat for Me. Personally, personally, I had to give up there for several professional reasons. But these 30 months of the Collective Chat for Me remained one of the most exciting periods of my life. I took a real pleasure in discovering, exploring, and explaining such an exquisitely rational idea. And I feel really proud and happy when I succeeded in convincing the ladies of the Belgian High Society in conference, uh, conference of knowledge and life, uh, connaissance et vie, it was a site of conference, and on, on basic income as a token for the present day in, in several count, uh, cities in Belgium. And it was attended mainly by the High Society. And so I was very proud and happy when I succeeded in convincing these ladies that it was not their families that endured the highest modern tax rates, but the unemployed when they find a job. Thank you very much. Thank also, to show the distance traveled, one of the immediate reactions to the publication of the Nouvelle was in a, a, a magazine called the uh, Main Factual Magazine, Belgium called Le Vif Express. And that title there was Le Paradis sur Terre, Paradise on Earth, meaning how ridiculous this idea is. Last week there was an interview with uh, François Maniquet, who is a very respected um, uh, economist here, a colleague at this university, a, a laureate of, of the Franqui Prize. He was interviewed, and the big title in the same journal was uh, Basic Income Can Be Financed. La Location Universelle est Finançable, that was the you know, the, the main thing that I put as a heading. Okay, now we have uh, the pleasure of uh, listening to Annie, Annie Miller, he is, uh, and who uh, was, I'll go back to the other slide, who was uh, chairing uh, this plenary session, which, uh, and it's still one of these pictures that is used uh, for the Vianne logo. We did this, the Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, I was invited here to uh, give a brief account uh, of what led me to the idea of basic income before 1986, what made me connect with the other co-founders of the and what have I been doing in connection with basic income since then. So here goes. I think I must have become a feminist at about the age of eight, when I realized that my mother did not have any money of her own, but had to ask my father for every penny, even to buy him a birthday present. He was kind and gentle, but inevitably he called the money. He controlled the money. As a young married working woman, I was shocked to find that I was expected to be dependent on my husband on times between work contracts. Also, my first tax return stated that if I were a married woman, I should pass it to my husband to fill in on my behalf, for which I would have to tell him all my financial secrets that I may have had, and the reciprocal of which was not required. Of course, any tax rebates would be paid to him. And anyway, I was the one who carried out the financial administration for both of us. I didn't think much of the UK social security or tax systems, especially for married women, and started thinking about alternatives. I very much came to this from a feminist perspective. I had read articles about social dividend, um, that was me, Brown and Dawson, Atkinson and so on, and in 1983, I wrote a departmental working paper entitled In Praise of Social Dividend and sent copies to people whom I thought might be interested. Later that year, I traveled from my home in Edinburgh to London to attend a one-day conference on income maintenance. During the workshops in the afternoon, I heard other people say, you wouldn't have that problem with a social dividend. We managed to identify each other because we'd all been working individually and didn't know of each other's existence. And uh, we went off to the pub afterwards to get to know each other and agreed to keep in touch. They included Hermione, known as Mimi Parker, who sadly has died, uh, Bill Jordan, who sadly couldn't be here, and Philip Vince. We met again a few times over the next year, and out of that, the Basic Income Research Group of Berg was born in 1984. I was surprised that for a group who were in agreement over the concept we argued fiercely about our individual ideas for about basic income schemes. There was a learning process too, to distinguish whether we wanted a BI for its own sake or for what it could achieve. In other words, it took quite a time to distinguish between instrument and objective, or means and ends. Also, we discussed whether we wanted a selected needs-based benefit or a social dividend, 
but it will be the same for everyone but the same age. Uh, could I? Uh, excuse me. Could you help me The next major event was the conference here in Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium in September 1986, to which I brought about 60 people from across Europe were invited. The conference was a wonderful experience, had a friendly atmosphere and was extremely stimulated. It concluded by agreeing to set up the Basic Income European Network, or BIANG. I was delighted then that we were both Berg and BIANG, which seemed to have a good ring to it. Um, with the aim of keeping a network of national organisations in touch with each other and organising a conference every two years. In 1989, Berg, uh, that's the uh, UK one, applied to become a charity. In 1991, it was granted generous funding by the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust to employ a part-time director and a part-time administrator on condition that it changed from being Berg to become the Citizens Income Trust, CIT, in order to ride on the crest of a, the wave of the contemporary debate about citizenship. The presence and position of the apostrophe in citizens are crucial, since otherwise it changes the meaning. This, a citizen's income, with the apostrophe before the S, emphasises that it must be paid on an individual basis. <coughs> CIT reached, uh, touched a low point in 2001, when our then director left, our chair, Evelyn McEwen, died, and the 10 years of generous funding came to an end. The trustees agreed to continue with private donations, volunteer administration, and volunteer contributions to a citizen's income newsletter. In fact, We've been operating on a shoestring. Our average income is about £3,000, which is about €3,500, and yet we managed to survive. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Torrey volunteered to be the director, and I agreed to take over as chair. Malcolm and I have worked closely together since 2001, and I'd like to acknowledge the enormous contribution that Malcolm has made to CIT over these last years. It's probably 90% due to his commitment, hard work, intellect, and super efficient administration that CIT has provided such a firm foundation for the BI debate in the UK. And it's continuing to make new partnerships as it takes on a more influencing role. Um, John McDonnell, now the Shadow Ch Chancellor, um, held a session in the House of Commons for us in, uh, for CIT in March 2014. Um, uh, my local member of the Scottish Parliament held a similar one in January 2014, and that seemed to spark off a lot of interest. There's lots more I could say. Um, I'm going to say that I'm writing a book at the moment, which should come out next March, so please uh, look out for it in case you're interested. Um, the, the Scottish Shrooms made a statement about, 20, uh, about basic income in 2014. The Scottish National Party um, it committed itself to the concept in their conference in March. Um, and the, the, um, the England and Wales Scottish, uh, England and Wales Green Party has also got a, a policy about basic income, but it's a long-term policy. They haven't really worked out the details or got the arguments to hand to uh, give interviews about it. I think that's probably all I can usefully say at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so Bill Jordan, who was uh, mentioned by uh, by Annie, is uh, the person you can see there, uh, just uh, in the front. Obviously, he was saying something funny, which he often did, uh, <laughs> judging by, not by his face, but the face of uh, the other people on uh, the panel. One of the people would I would have very much like to attend is Rachel Ruby, who was uh, one of our keynote speakers, the uh, penultimate person there uh, on the picture, who was the, the leader of a Dutch uh, trade union, which was really the spearhead at the time of the debate uh, in uh, the Netherlands. She would have liked to come, but not a family uh, occasion, which uh, just uh, today couldn't come. And Bill also couldn't come because he lost his wife recently and is still sort of uh, recovering psychology psychologically from him. Uh, Herman Mein Parker also mentioned is also on another picture. Sorry. 
But uh, now we listen to Klaus, who you can see, he hasn't changed that much <laughs> in these 30 years. When I first saw this uh, uh, picture, um, I did not recognize myself, except for that there must be a necktie, and, yeah. and I remember that I have one of them. Okay, this was good. It's not too much uh, similar. I, I thought about um, how I became part of this group that met in 86 in this uh, place, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure that, uh, how we came into contact. I, I, uh, I, there is blackout. I, I do not remember how I first came into contact Why? with the uh, with the group. But um, uh, after spending two or three days here, I uh, thought I I'm in the right company, uh, and uh, this is a project uh, through the inspiring leadership of. Uh, that is worth pursuing and uh, uh, spending time and uh, uh, efforts on. And uh, so, uh, what what is the intellectual background of the people who and the experience? Uh, that was the, the question. Well, I think an important step for me was uh, the topic of my. I was uh, trained as a sociologist. Um, the topic of my uh, PhD thesis, which was uh, uh, a critique of meritocracy in organizations. How come that some people earn so much more than other people in organizations where there is only indirectly uh, a market and where uh, status questions are resolved in ways that are organizational politics rather than, than markets. So a critique of meritocracy, which came out of the, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the 68 generation was very uh, much interested in these uh, questions. So, and then I uh, came across the uh, uh, memorandum that was mentioned before in some context, namely the Triple Revolution. Uh, Theobald was one of the major authors, and I was so uh, fascinated by this that I uh, translated it and it appeared in a German uh, journal, Atomzeitalter. Um, and um, so uh, this was, uh, I had also close contact to Andre Gortz, whom I met in, uh, when I was in Harvard in 1970, uh, and he was a visiting scholar there. So we had a, a, a very good uh, debate, but he was developing his ideas about farewell to the proletariat at that, that time. And uh, also, I must say, the other thing that I have the honor and pleasure to be a co-founder of is the German Green Party. And I uh, tried to... Uh, to sell them uh, the idea of basic income, which was in the first years quite uh, successful. Now it is uh, something that uh, uh, the leadership of the party does not like to talk about because there is so much controversy about it. And uh, uh, so it is in, in the German context, it is something, uh, an um, ambiguous label, if you are, someone wrote, uh, uh, Wikipedia entry about me, and the label is he is a supporter of basic income. Uh, I mean, uh, I have other characteristics than that, <laughs> but that is, that is uh, worth mentioning to this also. And it is a label that uh, 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 is very uh, ambivalent in the German uh, context. So. Uh, these were the, were the uh, uh, background uh, conditions in a way. And the more I, uh, I did a lot of uh, labor market studies, social policy studies, uh, when I first taught uh, 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 political science, and I have then converted to political science 
uh, in, at the University of uh, Bielefeld. And the more I thought about uh, this, the more uh, 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 deeply I, I got convinced that this is uh, something that is, uh, has a great future. And uh, let me just uh, say why I think it has a great future. One is the, the, the financing of uh, social security is undergoing two processes. One is the process of privatization. Much of your pension is on the third pillar namely if you buy insurance and life insurance and, and so on. The other is the, this, uh, the, the creeping fiscalization of social security in health, in pensions and in labor market. Much of the funding uh, occurs through uh, taxes rather than uh, social security contribution and that is uh, increasing. Uh, to conclude these rambling <coughs> thoughts and uh, recollections. I think there are, as, as Guy Stenning once uh, uh, said, uh, we should not think of basic income as a panacea. But there are three uh, uh, dimensions of it that apply to different situations. In the third world, uh, basic income has the function of stimulating local economies, creating demand, allowing people to, uh, to buy uh, things such as uh, sewing machines or uh, uh, bring their children up to the normal weight uh, they, uh, uh, they have. In a uh, uh, in democratic capitalism, uh, advanced societies the, of the OECD world, it has the function to uh, put a bottom to uh, the income distribution, and if all goes well, and we succeed uh, in, in the future uh, to uh, avoid, prevent uh, poverty. But uh, I think it has an additional function, and namely that is the function of liberating uh, people, liberating people under a re regime of that is policy regime under the imperative of employability, of whatever it costs. This is the uh, liberating function of basic income that allows people to say no to lousy jobs uh, which are uh, now uh, uh, the standard uh, in, in our type of society. Thank you. I do remember when I met uh, Klaus for the first time, in fact, when I was a, a very timid uh, graduate student at the University of Bielefeld for one semester. And there were these very uh, impressive uh, seminars that allegedly you think a seminar is a little group of uh, people. No, it was a seminar uh, where uh, the, the professors were Professor Klaus Hoffen and Professor Niklas Luhmann. And this was a little seminar where there were about 300 people attending every time. And so I, I never dared to talk to Professor Hoffer then. Since then, our relationship has been a bit, become a bit more familiar. Robert van der Wey. So, yeah. so may, I, may I do a Josh Cohen and <laughs> not use the microphone, use my own voice? I think I'm sufficiently enthusiastic to talk loudly about this. I hope not too long. Now, I'll do three things. I'll tell you about how I became a member of Bien at that memorable occasion in September 1986. Then I'll outline a few things that I've done since and I'll end up with uh, an interest in what next. So how did I get there? So I think I can say I and one of those people that are mentioned on the website in the, in the history of uh, Bien that um, thought of the things like or similar ideas to basic income as articulated in the uh, 
prize-winning essay, L'Allocation Universelle of the Collectif Jacques Fourier. Uh, that was a resounding statement, and that had an enormous influence on me. But how I came into this was as a member of the Political Science Department and Economics Institute of the University of Amsterdam, where I was under the influence of the student movement drawn into lecturing on Karl Marx. And so I was very much a kind of liberal interpreter of Marx, and I was thinking about ways in which how, how to interpret Marx in a more liberal way. And one of my ideas was that if you can end the compulsion to work, then you remove one primary source of Marxian exploitation, because Marxian exploitation is predicated on the notion of people in the wage contract being forced to do paid work. Now, remove that forcing aspect and you remove one source of exploitation. That was the basic motivating idea. And I tied that up to another idea uh, talked about by Marx in his famous critique of the Gotha program, where he talks about the transition, possible transition from a socialist society with collective ownership of the means of production and most of the social product going as the diminished proceeds of labor to the workers. And there was a part of that social product actually that intrigued me because that was from the beginning already distributed according to needs, both collective and private needs. And my idea was that if that, uh, that, that part of the net social product of labor could be expanded, then you would have a system in which by incentives generated among the workers under conditions of no compulsion to work, the free income, the basic income idea, you would have an uh, uh, economic transition uh, given the kind of productivity growth that Marx foresaw from contributions to needs. And that was the basic idea that I brought in. But I must say, when I came into contact with Philippe, uh, who recognized this uh, paper in, in a meeting of the so-called September group, which was mentioned yesterday, Eric is a one of the most prominent members today Happy to be here still, Eric. Um, and I, I want to say that Philippe took this up and he immediately said to me, well, we have to talk about this. Have you read the, the statement on the Allocation Universelle? And when I read that, I saw immediately that uh, Philippe was in one basic um, aspect ahead of me because he had, with the other people from the collective spelled out wonderfully the potential for uh, emancipatory transition-like processes within the capitalist society uh, managed by a welfare system. So let's say the Western European variety of capitalism. And so that, that was what brought me into this because then Philippe and I started collaborating very intensively uh, during 1983 up to 1985, we published an article called The Transition to Communism, which actually joined these two inputs, my ideas rather abstract about Marx, and the more concrete and I think more, more to the point uh, contribution of Allocation Universelle. So that's what got me into it, and I stayed in there. I must say I have not been a very active contributing member to Bien in the, uh, in the long time uh, that followed, but still I have done some things, not most notably uh, think, thinking about the uh, normative dimensions of the basic income. It's not enough to tell stories about transitions. It's not enough to tell stories about the possible liberating effects of basic income without having a rationale 
anchored in a sense of justice. And what brought me to that idea, of course, was sorry, uh, was the um, uh, one of the one of the members of the September group reacted to uh, the idea of basic income in this article about the transition by saying, "Well, look, actually, what what." Basic income is it's a recipe for the exploitation of the industrious by the lazy. And that is a very important, <laughs> important statement that we try to uh, accommodate and try to battle with in the years uh, after that. And uh, a, lot, a lot of my career has been actually devoted to thinking about good answer to that and similar points uh, which are around in the popular resistance to the idea of basic income that is still very lively, even though basic income has been researching. Now, to end very briefly, in the meantime, we have international developments. Guy is one prominent example of someone who has explored the transformative effects of basic income in the developing world, most notably in India. He will talk about that, no doubt, in a few minutes. But my idea would be, how about China? How about the 1.3 billion people in China that might be susceptible to the idea of basic income? Now, I don't know a lot about that yet. But I have tried to invent a Chinese name for basic income, which is uh, just a literal translation of unconditional income or income unconditional. Shou ru wu chao jian. Shou ru is income, wu chao jian is without conditions. And I hope to follow that development, possible development, in the near future, even though I realize that the most unlikely country to embrace a basic income in the near future is China. Thank you. But you need to think about the long term. So uh, uh, Robert is really investing. It is sort of uh, stepped back a little bit in terms of direct basic income activities, but he's in the process of doing whatever he can up to his last breath to spread basic income in China, and so every day he learns a few words of Chinese. You know? <laughs> I should say that, uh, and that's uh, very important, I think has been extremely important, will remain important for our network. A network consists of two things. One is a new letter, newsletter, I mentioned it before, but the other one is this organization every two years of, uh, of a congress. And Klaus organized a wonderful congress in Berlin in uh, 2000, uh, Robert, I think, jointly with Luke, also uh, organized a, a wonderful congress in, in uh, Amsterdam. And a guy uh, uh, organized probably one of the biggest congresses we've had in, uh, in Geneva at the time he was still working at the ILO. Guy is also, I'm sure he's here aware about that. You, we wouldn't be talking about Bien today. Uh, we hundreds of thousands of people wouldn't have pronounced the word bien in the world today, trying to pronounce it in the French or the Spanish way, if Guy hadn't had the idea of calling our network bien. So, Guy, please. Thank you very much. You won't need a microphone either. <laughs> the enthusiasm is still sufficient. Thank you, Philippe. It's great to be here. It's uh, obviously a very poignant moment for many of us. and. Uh, I, I think it's a, a very good moment to take stock of where we are. And as Philippe has mentioned, I have one claim to immortality. So if my epitaph is written tomorrow, it will be inventor of Pian, brackets the name. <laughs> but I, I think that's being a little unfair because it doesn't give credit to the couple of Belgian beers I had drunk just beforehand, <laughs> nor to the fact that Bill Jordan was sitting at the same table and he came up with a stupid name and immediately everybody, just to stop him being loquacious as Bill can be, immediately said, okay, let's go for Pierre. 
<laughs> so that's the first thing. The second thing, I think it's being a little unfair to me because I'm also the inventor of the rejection of our name. Okay? I actually propose that we should change our name. And with Eduardo and one long drinking evening in San Paolo, we came up and I said, well, the obvious thing to do is keep Bian but make it Earth. And I was chair of the meeting in Barcelona when we proposed it, and it was controversial to change the title at the time. So I second, I think that my epitaph should have inventor of the name, disinventor of the name, and reinventor of the name altogether. So it's a long epitaph. Now, I, w I want to take stock some of us began our interest in basic income, and Annie has made some good comments about that. Before Charles Fourier existed, we, I, I learned my values about it with James Mead, who was my, one of my tutors at Cambridge, and we certainly developed it with the social dividend orientation towards it. The emancipation and values and social justice were integral to our thinking, but we came at it from different channels. And I wrote a small book criticizing the Thatcherite government in 1982, concluding with saying that, that the inequalities are going to multiply, and unless we move to a system where everybody has some sort of social dividend, we're going to have such chronic insecurity and inequalities that there will be dis destabilizing developments. And I was about to publish this book, and the Director General of the ILO called me in and said, listen, I'm awfully sorry, but the British government has protested, and you can't publish a book. And he said, I, I don't know, why? What's, what have they got against the book? Can they disprove what I've got, all, all of my statistics? And he said, no, but we can't publish it. I, I'll tell you what I'll do, though, he said. I think it's a very good book, he said. I'm going to give you some money so you can write some other books <laughs> so that it's not just one country. So he gave me $20,000 to spend on developing those books. So I wrote in Sweden and, and Finland and so on. We ended up with seven books. And basically, I've just been reflecting in the bath this morning, my own intellectual journey. I won't go into it now. I've only got a couple of minutes. But the intellectual journey, I think, has a certain consistency in my own mind. And I just published the latest of the, the, the line. It's called The Corruption of Capitalism. Just come out this month. So it sort of coincides with the 30th anniversary in my own development. Some of you would say, well, capitalism is always corrupt. But basically, what I'm arguing in the book is the Paynean argument, the George-type the the George arguments that rentier capitalism has developed to such an extent that we're living a lie. It's a corruption of their own claims about capitalism. They claim they're in favor of free markets, and yet we have the most unfree market system ever created. But it's creating this rental income which gives us the capacity to imagine a new income distribution system. That's basically the theme of the book. Now, the as I was reflecting on that, I was thinking in the bath, and I was saying, let us go back to the beginning of Bian. Yeah. There wasn't any one of us, none, no one of us, it was a group. Are we greater or less than the sum of the parts? I think we are. I think Bian has been and will continue to be greater than the sum of the parts. Why is that? How do you sustain an organization which has inherent tensions, ideological tensions, for 30 years. I think there's a lot of credit in that. And I was reflecting that a lesson I learned when I entered the United Nations is always complete a circle. If you're in a big political organization and you're a radical and you're in a minority, you're going to put out propositions. And then you're going to get attacked by the majority. Right? You're going to be ridiculed and the rest of it. And it's vital in a bureaucracy to complete the circle, which is give an answer, answer back. But in doing the answering back, you automatically create more enemies in a bureaucracy. And I had to exist like that in the United Nations for 30 years, and that is the nature of being academic, being 
uh, political body. The essence of bien is that we've avoided that model. We've avoided that model by accepting that there are tensions between us, ideological, methodological, emphasis, tensions, but we've always managed to keep the tone cool and avoid personalizing and attacking each other. I can honestly say that has kept the organization going. No personalized tensions because we've stepped back each time. And that's been a very important part. Now I'm worrying at the moment, as I've worried at several times, don't forget I was co-chair for 22 years, 22 years, and organizing conferences and being part of many of the conferences, 10 of them in, in total, and all of them have had those little tensions. And we've managed to keep those tensions under control. At the moment, the little tension that worries me is about pilots. Now, let's be very careful. We've made more advances with our pilots in developing countries in the last five years than 25 years of talking about surface of Malibu. I promise. But of course, pilots have their limitations. We should all recognize that. But be very careful when we talk about it in big public meetings to make sure we keep the tone cool between us. Because otherwise, somebody's going to have to complete the circle. And we don't want that. I think if that's the latest tension, there will be others. And I think Bien will continue to manage the tensions between the libertarians and the republicans, the Marxists and the ideologues on the, on the right. I think that's been a major lesson. I think we're on the cusp of something really dramatic. I'm going to say something about that later, but we certainly feel the momentum that is building up around the world. Milton Friedman, with whom we don't have a lot in common, made a comment. He said, all great ideas take about 30 years to go from being rejected as completely stupid to being accepted as inevitable. I think, <laughs> I think we're about on course to getting that consensus out there from a variety of directions. So let us keep it up, because I, as Carl said to me when we were walking here this morning, what we want is that we shall be not needed in another 30 years. Thanks very much. <laughs>